everyone. Welcome to March's episode of Books for Thought. Thanks for joining. My name is Amy and I'm an education counsellor at IEC. Today I'm going to be organising George Yates from Regents University in London. George is a senior lecturer in English Literature on the Liberal Arts Programme at Regents. After getting his PhD in English Literature at King's College, Cambridge, he then went on to his first teaching posts at Gertham and Newham Colleges in Cambridge before becoming a lecturer at Regents in 2011. Broadly, his interests lie within 19th and 20th century literature, and teaching-wise, he specialises in Shakespeare. Today, George is going to share two great books with us for students interested in literature or indeed liberal arts in general, but I'll let him tell you all about them. George, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks very much for inviting me, Amy. It's oh, very nice to be here. <laughs> um, maybe you could start telling us a little about yourself and what led you to studying English literature. Um, I was drawn to English literature as a subject, I think, for a couple of reasons. Um, Firstly, because I was quite inspired when I was quite young um, by the way in which writers use language as this kind of creative instrument uh, to not just describe the kind of the world or the reality as we experience it, but to, to bring into being, in a sense, alternative or, or complementary realities. Um, and I think that's a quality uh, all the great writers uh, have that their works can be relevant to our world, but they also have a kind of, a kind of self-sufficiency. Um, if you think about the way, for instance, people sometimes speak of the novels of Graham Greene, people sometimes say that they're, they're all set in a place called Greenland. And of course, that's a joke, meaning that there, there is a kind of an internal coherence to, to, to Greene's fictional worlds, that they, they all have a similar kind of structure and atmosphere and, and mood. Um, and yeah, I, I find something quite um, sort of entrancing about the, the that whole that whole process. Um, and then I think the the other main reason would be I kind of enjoy the way in which literature is a subject through which you can kind of explore what you might call concepts or ideas, but through if you like narratives and individual stories. Um, if you were to think of maybe academic subjects as being a bit like sort of houses on a street. You could say, I think that, that literature's neighbours are on one side uh, history and on the other side, maybe uh, philosophy. Um, in a sense, literature borders on history because some of what we do involves studying specific facts and learning specific, yeah, culturally specific kinds of information to do with the historical circumstances surrounding texts or the, the life history of the writers, or, or the content, the literal content of the text. But that literal content, like philosophy, I think also conveys uh, kind of ideas and values that are less, in a way, time bound, that, that, that endure across time uh, and, and speak to us across kind of cultural barriers. Um, so I think those were the two, main, the, the two main sources of inspiration. I probably couldn't have put it quite like that, <laughs> when those sources of inspiration came to me but looking back I think no that's really, really cool that's really interesting and what is it you most enjoy teaching about um English literature within the liberal arts program at, at Regents and sort of what makes Regents a great place to study and moreover study English literature in particular well uh Regents is a very sort of niche uh institution it's quite different from any other institution I've ever worked in um or ever uh visited uh especially in that it's ex exceptionally internationally diverse, even by the standards of, of universities. It's by far the most internationally diverse um, university I've worked in, which means the students bring a, a very diverse range of tastes and knowledge uh, to the classroom. Um, and it's also quite a, a relatively small institution, which means it has a very kind of family kind of atmosphere so uh, I would know all my learners, all the learners in my class by name. Uh, I usually know who their favorite writers are, who their favorite artists are, uh, you know, what their favorite food is sometimes. Um, and uh, I enjoy that, that kind of very personalized contact uh, that, that we have between yeah, learners and, and teachers that would be uh, less likely to happen, I think, perhaps in a in a large institution where where I was lecturing to you know potentially a hundred people or more uh, at a time. Oh, that's really lovely. And what would you say is sort of a typical profile or the the common interests of, a, of an English literature student at at Regents? 
Uh, in terms of their kind of their kind of concerns or the things that they're perhaps most passionate about, that they're often quite interested, I think, in making connections between, if you like, past or what you could call classic literature and kind of present day issues or concerns. So they're often um, very interested in something like the the way in which, say, a Shakespearean comedy explores questions of, of identity and especially gender identity and the way we seem to have this interest in kind of gender fluidity or what we would now call in a way non-binary gender identity in, in Shakespeare's plays um, or the way in which a novelist like Dickens addresses social questions, social problems that are still with us today, things like the sort of the side effects of man-made pollution or, or widely differentiated sort of ex extremely differentiated living standards within a single community or uh, the impact of kind of economic cycles on, on, on the economically vulnerable. Um, so yeah, I think they're often interested in, 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 in drawing the kinds of insights we get from these kind of past authors into, into yeah, issues, questions that still affect us. Uh, still affect us today. And in terms of their learning style, I think the learners at Regents tend to enjoy quite interactive learning because th there really are no, no passive lectures. Um, all the sessions are very interactive, very discussion-based, very kind of activity-based. So they, they tend to be people who like to, like to talk uh, as well as uh, liking to listen. That's good. That's really nice. So very inquisitive and, and interactive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, well, thank you so much. Now, um, moving on to the first book, um, should we start with the nonfiction? Maybe you could tell right. us um, about the book. Um, first of all, well, what the book is, sorry. Um, why have you chosen to share it with us today and, and what makes it a great read for potential English literature students? Great. Well, the book I chose is uh, Mary Wollstonecroft's uh, Letters Written in Sweden, Norway and Denmark uh, from 1796. And in terms of its genre, you probably call it a book of travel writing. Um, and the reason why I chose it is because it's a work that explores uh, a whole kind of range of um, subject matters and kind of ideas and forms of literary representation or modes of literary depiction that a student might go on to encounter at university. So it's, it's kind of a, a good introduction to quite a wide range uh, of topics. And the context uh, to her writing the book was um, essentially the kind of the social and political situation in Europe just after the French Revolution. So it, it's published in 1796. French Revolution happened in 1789, and the author Wollstonecraft was one of those who, who thought of the revolution as essentially advancing the cause of, of human freedom and, and, and human progress. And then seven years after the revolution, she went on this journey through Scandinavia um, to assist uh, her lover, an American uh, businessman called uh, Gilbert Imlay. Uh, and she was hoping to assist him by tracing a kind of uh, a missing ship, in particular, uh, a missing vessel containing uh, a kind of uh, a cargo of silver. And uh, her lover, the author's lover, Imle, had sent this ship to, and this silver to Scandinavia uh, in order to exchange it for grain to send to France, because in the aftermath of the revolution, France was subject to a kind of an economic embargo, an economic blockade uh, by other states. And Imle and Wollstonecraft were, were basically hoping to break the blockade to kind of support uh, the revolutionary government there. Um, and so she, in a way, it's a kind of treasure hunt narrative or the inspiration for the narrative was a kind of treasure hunt narrative because she was looking for the ship and indeed she succeeded in, in finding it. However, she used the opportunity of going on this journey for this quite specific purpose or goal. Uh, she used that opportunity to kind of record her impressions and observations and responses to these three nations as she traveled through them. And she doesn't actually include the reason for the journey, the fact that she was looking for the ship in the text itself. So what you really have is a kind of almost a travel diary uh, in a way in which 
um, yeah, she records her, her thoughts, her feelings, her insights into these kinds of three uh, these kind of three societies, um, and records these in the forms of letters, which are, are addressed to a kind of anonymous or a, or an unspecified he or him, which we now know was actually Imlay, but which in a way becomes a, 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 a kind of technique for addressing a more general or, or impersonal kind of reader. Um, so yeah, it's basically a travel diary of a, of a sort of a very intelligent, very sensitive woman's thoughts, um, encountering three, three countries she'd never visited before and thinking about what she admired and disliked in their modes of sort of social organization. Oh, that's really interesting. And what about um, maybe on a more personal level? What have what have you learned from this book? And and is there anything in particular that you find you found um, particularly interesting about it? Right. I think the thing I enjoy most about it is the way she kind of bridges between all these different kinds of topics. So she she was very kind of politicized as a writer and a thinker. Uh, some of the viewers may well uh, know her her work, A uh, Vindication of the Rights of Women which she'd published a few years uh, earlier. So uh, she was very um, interested in the kinds of political systems and in the, yeah, the kind of social uh, conventions of these societies. Um, and there's something I think quite, um, yeah, inspiring about the idea of this, this woman who was a young mother, like she, she took her, her baby with her to Gothenburg and then the baby stayed with a nurse while she, who went on the rest of the journey and yeah I think there's just something very inspiring about this this single woman going through quite remote parts of, of Scandinavia and kind of sticking her nose into all kinds of yeah uh, sort of economic and political issues asking everyone uh, you know what the laws were in a given society and uh, what the kind of customs were and why the customs were like that and had they thought of organizing the, the kind of customs or laws in a different kind of way so yeah, her kind of political, social kind of inquisitiveness, curiosity, I think is very inspiring. Um, but between those more, what you might call political or socially critical sections, which tend to be inspired by the towns she was visiting, uh, places like uh, Gothenburg, Copenhagen, later Hamburg, which was then part of Denmark. Um, between those towns, she's also very responsive to the kind of landscape and to the, uh, to the natural scenery through which she's traveling. And in her descriptions of the natural scenery, we can see her using these kinds of, these styles or, or these kind of modes of literary representation um, that became very influential on later writers. Uh, in particular, she, she sometimes uses a kind of a style known as the sublime, which is a, is a way of kind of describing nature as very exhilarating and very exciting, but also rather terrifying uh, and rather kind of overwhelming. And there are certain passages in which she has a kind of um, an almost out of body kind of visionary experience in which the spectacle of one of these sublime kind of landscapes kind of transports her into this kind of reverie. Uh, beyond, in a way, the boundaries of ordinary perception. So I think there's something quite interesting, quite daring in the way she kind of bridges or leaps between a kind of, in a way, political journalism on the one hand and um, this very kind of lyrical um, uh, nature writing uh, on the other. Modes of writing that would probably now, in the present day, we might expect to find in different books, but which she kind of fuses together. Wow, yeah, she sounds very brave, not just in the way she approached her writing, but also the way she was was traveling and 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 talking to people. So it's very interesting. And, yeah, um, one of the things they used to say to us that she 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 asked men's questions because she, was, <laughs> um, she there, there was no question that she regarded as being inappropriate no? or suitable for her to wow. ask on the on, on the on the basis of her gender. So I think she was probably quite pleased when they yeah uh, yeah when they when they said that. Oh, cool. And uh, is there anything that future readers you think should keep in mind um, before, or before, yeah, before reading this book? Um, uh, I'd say the key thing to keep in mind is that um, is that is in a way the the actual reason or the motivation for the original journey in the first place. And I will share with you because I think it makes a little bit more sense um, the the information that actually 
immediately prior to taking this journey to recover the missing silver, uh, she'd been rather traumatized by her lover's, uh, if you like, sexual infidelity or, or the fact they weren't exclusive, as we might say. And she had actually made a suicide attempt shortly before writing the book. So, uh, which obviously she survived. Um, so the, the occasional passages that you get of what you might call introspective um, sort of self-analysis or these occasional passages where she expresses and she kind of explores her own uh, sometimes rather melancholy kind of response to certain kinds of scenes or certain kinds of spectacles. I think those passages make more sense when you realize that she was also dealing with, I guess, what we'd now call depression, uh, you know, uh, of, of some kind. So we should probably cut her a bit of slack when she, uh, when she, she goes into what, might, what otherwise might seem slightly digressive passages. Oh, well, yeah, it's a good, uh, good contextual information to have there. Well, I can see why that's a really, really great book for potential English literature students. And also, I suppose, um, liberal arts in general, I can see that it, it, it draws from, from other subjects that would, would be involved in, in a liberal arts course. Absolutely. I think if you're interested in politics, there'd be a lot there for you because um, she, um, yeah, she, she studies quite specific political differences between these states in particular. She's very positive about Norway as being a relatively egalitarian society where the laws surrounding, for instance, the transmission of property um, enable property to be, to be distributed relatively evenly and you don't have a kind of monopolization of wealth and property. Um, on the other hand, there'd be a lot there for, for someone who's interested in history because she gives us this insight into the, basically the, the kind of the post French revolutionary uh, geopolitical kind of tensions in Europe. Also, if you're interested in art history, the kinds of literary style that she's using, this interest in the sublime when she's seeing waterfalls or, or mountains or kind of remote, spectacularly overwhelming places, that style also uh, appears in the art of the period that there's also a kind of a visual sublime as well as a verbal sublime. So uh, very interesting for a kind of a literary student, but if you weren't quite decided or hadn't quite made up your mind between a few different kind of uh, academic subjects, I think the book would definitely have something for you. Yeah, it sounds like a really great read. And moving on to fiction now, what have, what have you picked for us? And can you again tell us a little bit what it's about, when it was written, when where it's set and... Absolutely. Uh, my fiction choice is, is Howard's End by, by E.M. Forster, Edward Morgan Forster, uh, a fellow Kingsman, graduate of King's College, Cambridge, the, uh, the television room at my, uh, my uh, undergraduate college was uh, Forster's old rooms. Um, but that isn't why I've chosen it. That's just a coincidence. Um, nice coincidence. And this is a, uh, a book which is basically uh, a classic example of, of the way in which a novel can kind of capture and explore uh, almost an entire society, kind of at a moment in time. And that moment in time is essentially Forster's own time, which is the first decade of the 20th century. So it's about British society around 1905, 1910, pre-First World War. Um, and it focuses upon the lives of a group of characters who each kind of embody a, a dimension or an aspect uh, of this society. Um, and the action takes place uh, in London or in a part of a county called Hertfordshire, which at the time was a, was a kind of a rural uh, district, uh, some miles to the north of London, about 25 miles, 30 miles north of London. And the title, uh, Howard's End uh, refers to a, a family uh, whose final member uh, dies out at quite an early point in the novel and also refers to the name of their, their house, the, 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 the place where they lived in, in Hertfordshire. Um, so in some respects, the novel is in, in a way elegiac in that it sort of looks back on the kind of way of life that this family would have lived in rural Hertfordshire and which is now dying out. And the, the death of that last family member in a way represents the, the kind of disappearance of their way of life. Quite agrarian, they were a family of, of farmers, smallholders, small scale uh, farmers, um, uh, quite stable way of life and a quite rural way of life. And the idea is that that 
that way of life Forster thinks is disappearing as Britain becomes more urbanized, you know, more industrialized, uh, more kind of commercialized. But the book is also very forward looking because one of the key questions in the book is who will inherit that house, that house where the Howards lived. And at an early point in the book, the, the dying final member of the family changes her mind about who she's going to leave this house to, who will inherit this house from her. Another character, I won't say who, because I don't want to spoil it, another character then frustrates her wishes. And then we have various plot twists and turns. So I think the heart of the book's plot, in a way, concerns this, this building, this family home, um, which at an early point in the narrative, the final surviving member of the Howard family, who passes away at an early point in the novel, um, she kind of bequeaths uh, this, this home, her, her family's historic home to another character. Another character then frustrates her, her wishes, basically changes the will. I won't say who, because I don't want to spoil it. And we then have various twists and turns through the course of the book concerning the question of who will inherit the, the home, who will actually go on to live in the home. And I think in a way, Forster wants us to think of the home as almost encapsulate, and the future of the home as almost encapsulating the future of the country. The, the kind of the question is what kind of, of, of country England will become and um, uh, yeah, who will inherit in a way the, the, the future. Um, so yeah, he's using this kind of specific building and the lives of this specific group of characters to um, as a kind of an encapsulation of, uh, of kind of a wider society and of what the future of this society will be, what kind of power balance there will be, uh, what kind of cooperation um, or perhaps exploitation might take place between different different figures or different groups within this within this kind of society who are represented by the individual characters. Wow. And um, what would you say some of the maybe principal concepts represented in this book and what should students be on the lookout for as, as they read? So Forster's, um, I think, a, a classic example of what we sometimes call a kind of social realist kind of writer in this book, um, which essentially means that in, in telling the stories of these individual characters, he intends us to think of the characters as, as representing what you might call social factions or social groups or especially kind of economic classes. Um, so the class identity and the class position of the individual characters is always very important. And in particular, I'll pick out kind of three groups of characters. Firstly, we've got the Wilcoxes and Mr. Wilcox uh, has married the last of, of the Howards. Um, so he's the husband of, of, of the final member of the Howard family. And Mr. Wilcox is a businessman who in a way embodies uh, the kind of the power of commerce and uh, finance and also a kind of imperialism because he has business concerns in, in Africa, I think in Nigeria, um, and who has this quite uh, materialistic uh, kind of outlook on the world. Surprisingly, we might think his family, before his first wife's death, strike up a friendship with a second family, and these are the Schlegels. Uh, and the Schlegels are less wealthy than the Wilcoxes, but they do have a kind of inherited income. And the, the focal members of the Schlegels are two sisters, an older one called Margaret and a younger, younger one called Helen. And they've also got a, a brother. And because the Schlegels don't really have to work for a living, um, they sort of pursue quite intellectual and cultural interests and, and focus upon a life of what you might call spiritual refinement. You know, they go to uh, concerts a lot, they visit art galleries, they talk about books. So that they embody what you might call a kind of cultural intelligentsia. And in a way, they're a kind of an affectionate satire on a Forster's own social circle, um, who, who, who lived quite a similar kind of life. Uh, and then the third key figure is a, uh, a working uh, person kind of on the borders of the what you might call the working or, or perhaps lower middle class called Leonard Bass. And Bass as a young man is in a way between the two sets of characters. On the one hand, he's very 
attracted to culture and an art and um, uh, a kind of spiritual sort of self enrichment uh, and, and the kinds of pursuits that the Schlegels enjoyed. But because he is a working person and he's a kind of, you might say, a wage slave, Forster's writing at the time when there was very, very minimal forms of state support, uh, things like the modern benefit system, there would people were just beginning to envisage those kinds of systems, but they didn't really exist in the way they do now. So Bast, as a wage slave, is very, very economically vulnerable, which means he, he's also very aware of, and yet very vulnerable to, the kinds of basically economic concerns that also motivate Wilcox. The difference is that for Bass, um, a kind of awareness of um, economic concerns doesn't mean buying a, a, a third house or buying a second car. It means having enough to eat and having enough to pay the rent. Um, so as we see these kinds of characters interacting with one another, in a way, I think Forster is asking us to think about how both as individuals and as a society, we can kind of balance the kinds of concerns and the priorities that affect these different characters. You know, on the one hand, Wilcox, uh, Mr. Wilcox might seem a rather sort of single minded and um, rather one dimensional character in, in always prioritizing basically economic considerations, um, the pursuit of wealth and power over, over other factors. But on the other hand, uh, the, the, the Schlegels can sometimes also seem perhaps rather uh, privileged and rather naive in inhabiting this sort of, uh, this ivory tower in which they can just, they're, they're, they're relatively insulated from those kinds of, those kinds of factors. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I think Force is asking us to think about what sort of balance a society should kind of strike between these different kinds of concerns and how people who belong to these different kinds of social factions might or might not be able to establish uh, a sense of relationship, a sense of fellowship, a sense of, in one of his favourite words, connection with one another, or, or whether they just won't be able to, whether their, their ways of life and their values are just too uh too kind of uh yeah too incompatible for that to happen and although i won't give away too much about the plot to go back to the house um the various plot twists and various kinds of liaisons and interactions between these these individual characters cause the three families lives to become quite intertwined so on a very literal level we have this question which family or families will inherit the house and how will they in a sense cohabit uh, there will it only belong to one of them or will they somehow share uh, the building uh, and i won't say too much about the plot twists that provoke that question but i think if you read the novel you'll you'll see what i mean by it yeah sounds really sounds really great and how did the how did the novel impact you and um what do you hope readers will will take away from this book uh, I think it, it inspired me to read more socially critical, what you might call Edwardian fiction. If you don't know that word, uh, it's just a way of referring to kind of literature from after Queen Victoria, but before, you know, the 19, the, the, the post First World War period, um, uh, which I think is a slightly neglected period in literature. Um, and yeah, it made me want to read some of Forster's contemporaries, books like Rebecca West's The Return of the Soldier, John Galsworthy's The Foresight Saga which are also these books um, which in a way contrast what you might call material and spiritual forms of fulfillment and kind of show as characters trapped between um, uh, essentially achieving a kind of a kind of social success or social kind of prestige and on the other hand achieving what you might call emotional or spiritual uh, fulfillment fulfillment or, or happiness uh, and it also actually inspired uh, me to want to visit the, the part of the country where it's set, that part of Hertfordshire. Uh, my, my partner and I like to cycle uh, around that part of the world. And, and sometimes when you're in, uh, you're cycling along the kind of the quiet lanes of Hertfordshire, uh, you can almost feel like you're still in, in, in Forster's England. Uh, and you can feel that actually the kind of 
almost universal suburbanization, which is one of the things the book predicts in its in its more sort of pessimistic passages, partly because Forster was writing at the time when the modern English road network was being built. So in a way, towns and cities were kind of becoming closer to get together and were becoming kind of more joined and the, the spaces between them were kind of shrinking. Um, but uh, when you cycle along, yeah, the, the, the Green Sand Way or the other kinds of B roads of Hertfordshire, uh, you, 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 can, you can feel, I think, as though, yeah, you're, 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 you're kind of, be, you've, you've transported yourself into, into the landscape that inspired, uh, inspired Forster's texts. Um, and wh wherever uh, readers are based in the world, uh, I think it's a book that really encapsulates the ability of the novel to, uh, to kind of tell personal individual stories, but in telling those stories to explore what you might call macro social questions. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd very much encourage uh, readers who might be new to reading relatively long novels to, uh, to enjoy the way. The, the novel can strike that balance between giving us very personal individual uh, narratives, but also telling the story of a, of a kind of a society as a whole. Wow, thank you so much. Well, that's all the questions that um, I have for you today. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I think the watchers will agree. It was very, very interesting interview. And yeah, thank you so much. Is there anything uh, my else? My pleasure, Amy. Great to, great to speak to you. And um, yeah, yeah, happy, happy reading.